Within the walls of the old Darden Mill here behind me in Elkins, West Virginia, on the night of October 5th, 2023, we witnessed an event where a man invited the spirit of another man long gone to possess him before a crowd of people. Wow! So now I'm going to bring on Mr. Crayon. Before we get into the wild spectacle of David Struther manifested in the flesh, a little backstory. <laughs> you did a great job. You know where Joe comes out of it. The, the, the dry fork and the bleeding. Don Teeter is a delight. I'm looking a bit colonial. I'm a wig. <laughs> and he has a story for everything. I had the pleasure of meeting with him a few weeks before the show. My batteries ran out way before his experiences did, and I have a lot of batteries. <laughs> Where I started with that whole stirring and stuff, <laughs> but I, that's where I ended up. The great thing about using his sketches is I don't have a script when I do the portrayals, but every sketch triggers the story. Sure. So I can't get lost. I flip the sketch. Oh, that's what I talk about now. And then if I start wandering off into Never Never Land, just like I'm doing here. Um, Eventually, I flip to the next sketch. No, that's, that's where I'm supposed to be. We'll get to that map in a minute. The 1800s and their severe style of portraiture. Man. And so I'll tell you just a, a little bit about him. Uh, David Hunter Struther, he was from what is now the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. Grew up around Martinsburg, Shepherdstown, uh, Berkeley Springs. Uh, witnessed a lot of history in that area was a topographic mapper for the Union uh, during the Civil War, which upset a lot of his family members, uh, many of whom owned slaves. And in fact, his uncle, Andrew Hunter, was the prosecuting attorney at John Brown's treason trial. Uh, so it's easy to see how they had a little split in the family. A brief period early in his career, after he came back from uh, being trained as an artist in Europe, he actually studied under Samuel F. B. Morse who was a famous artist who then made his fortune developing the telegraph. Uh, made more money on the telegraph than he ever made from art. But Port Crown made his living for a year or two doing portraits of well-to-do people in the Ohio Valley and you know, on commission or selling them those portraits. 
And you can see that as compared to his sketches that often have a caricature nature, he could do a portraiture art, you know? He could capture the look of a person. He did sketches in New Orleans. Uh, the one story he told of the, the sketches in New Orleans when there were, cotton was being loaded onto boats there. And of course slaves before the war loading the cotton. And one man had come over and claimed that one of the slaves had stolen something from his, uh, his goods there. And the guy in charge of the slaves had said, well, point him out to me which one and then we'll get this straightened out. And the guy had said in the classic, the black guys all look alike. He's like, well, can a farmer tell one sheep from another? How do you tell the difference between them? You look at pork crayon sketches of a black man, a white man, or whatever. He captures the personality of the person. Actually, I'm fascinated by almost all of it because he was a, a part of what they called the local color writer's movement where you're capturing what's going on out there. Some writers in New England, like Washington Irving, were doing the same kinds of things. So no matter where you're reading about, and he knew when to go where. He did a series of stories in Harper's called uh, A Summer in New England. Another series called A Winter in the South. <laughs> he knew when to go where. This was their first night camped out in that territory over there. Uh, this is one of their guides. I believe this is the other guy. They were both from what is now Garrett County, Maryland. And they went out into the Blackwater country, total wilderness, because they wanted to get there before the railroad got there. They wanted to see it when it was still unspoiled. Uh, he it. sketched those falls. Oh, and, uh, and I have, you know, talking about trying to do the side-by-side the -side things, I've photographed those falls. There's a little bit of artistic, artistic exaggeration with the height yeah. of the first fall. Right. I don't know that it's a deliberate exaggeration or if it's just a perception thing. But when I do those photographs, I try to find the same perspective, the same yeah. where I feel like, okay, this is probably where he was sitting when he did this sketch. Yeah. And it's clearly identifiable still with the, the configuration of the falls. Yeah. But upstream from there, and then there was rhododendron on both sides of the stream, pretty thick, like down through the canyon still is. And uh, there was one member of their group that they called Mr. X. And Mr. X, he says, was short for ex-member of Congress, uh, and that he, for the sake of his dignity, he would not further identify him. Although his biographer, I think, does identify him. I'll have to look at yeah. a little more of that So, But anyway, they're, they're walking right in the stream because the rhododendron is so thick on the sides yeah. and Mr. X had been wanting to get a shot of a deer and the deer ran across in front of him and he scrambled to try and get a shot. He fell down the creek, jumped back up, soaked him wet and poor crown did a sketch of this and Mr. X standing there in the stream right. sopping wet, wet. Yeah. and water running out both barrels of the right. shotgun and the poor crown says that the other members of the party Encouraged Mr. X to uh, go ahead, Mr. X. I have a crack at him. Bad that's way. Right. That's right. And uh, yeah. he used the line that's very indicative of his like dry, almost English sort of sense of humor. That Mr. X politely requested the other members of the party should remove themselves to a place where cold water would not be so easily obtained. Yeah. <laughs> and here's camp on the black. And I am pretty sure. I know exactly where that was at. When you go down through Blackwater Camp, down below Cope, you're on the rail trail, and you know where Douglas Falls is. Just above Douglas Falls, and the reason I'm pretty confident of it is, and I dropped that story a while ago when I was talking there when he was there, his cousin Philip Bennett McKinney wasn't in camp. They were camped right at the top of the falls that he was calling the Falls of the Blackwater. And there's still a campsite there. There's a fire pit there. It's right smack dab at the top of the falls. And he talked about being in camp 
and it was raining heavily, the water was rising, they were worried about where Penn Kennedy was, and some stuff came washing down the stream and washed over the falls, and it was actually just tree branches and stuff, but it looked like his gangly, skinny cousin going over the falls. Well, based on that story, I feel like this camp is right at the top of Douglas Falls. But the stories that are in the, or the journey that the Blackwater Chronicle is based upon mm -hmm. is the same journeys that Port Crayon's Harper's Magazine articles are based on. And, and gentlemen of substance at that time did not publish in the popular journals using their own name. They came up with a pseudonym. Okay. So his was Port Crayon. Uh, and, and a port crayon is a, a French term for a writing tool or an artist tool that's kind of like a mechanical pencil, where it's a brass rod that's split on both ends, a little sliding ring, and they usually have a soft lead in one end and a hard lead in the other. But what does all of this really have to do with trains? What I'm trying to do is an artist for trail of, um, I'll just give you all the paperwork, it's an amazing story. It's like the first instance of the railroad using art to promote the industry. And it was only about 30 years into the railroad being in the U.S. So okay. it's super cool. And the story is like a bunch of Hellraisers getting on this B&O train and, you know, sponsored it. They sent him out and they're like, here, take this excursion so that you can promote the beauty. Now let's get back to the map. Remember the map? And one other thing we'll go ahead and look at is a map. It's not an extremely detailed map, but the excursion started in Baltimore, out through Ellicott's Mills, entered West Virginia at Harper's Ferry, proceeded on through Martinsburg, they visited Berkeley Springs, uh, passed through Cumberland, uh, then on across the mountains, uh, through the area where Rollsburg is, and through Grafton, and eventually to Wheeling. So that does give you a little perspective. So they came into West Virginia here at Harper's Ferry. And ended up here. Let's slow that down a little bit, shall we?
got the railways. And there is well, yeah, they, 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 it's a, you know, corporate consolidations. Um, the uh, the B&O, the old B&O and the Western Maryland, and of course, there's only just fragments of the Western Maryland left anymore, um, including right here. Yeah. And even, of course, the Western Maryland um, ended up acquiring uh, Henry G. Davis's railroad to West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh, who people usually refer to as the West Virginia Central. But that's been a constant in the railroad industry, is the consolidation and acquisition and all of those kinds of things. That's, yeah. uh, that's not a, a new development. Take that trip, though. I don't think CSX is going to allow it. <laughs> Now that we've traveled into the past, ladies and gentlemen, at long last, the moment we've all been waiting for. Good evening, friends. Good evening. I was very pleased to receive an invitation to speak to such an obviously refined and well-educated group. It, it is always gratifying when a person finds that their interests are shared by refined people. We're talking about steam, steam power, steam locomotion. Now the understanding of what steam could do has been around for a couple of thousand years, but it was never harnessed. At an early time, people could understand that a jet of steam could make something spin around, but they had not found practical applications for that. And in fact, the railroad itself was developed mostly in England, but it never reached its full flower until it had come across to our shores. And then American ingenuity and American enthusiasm made the railroad take off. And this excursion on the B&O Railroad, we took only four years after the railroad had first reached Wheeling. The railroad began construction in Baltimore, July 4th of 1828. And I spoke of that American ingenuity, that American enthusiasm, that American ability to get things done. Within 30 years, of when those spikes were first driven in downtown Baltimore, there were 30,000 miles of rails stitching our country together. And they've continued to grow since then. Now this excursion was the B&O's effort to get the word out to the public that this railroad was for more purposes than just carrying coal and timber to markets, a carrying grain. They wanted to let people know there's great scenery out there in the mountains where this railroad is traveling. So they invited all manner of artists. The new art of photography, certainly brother artists and poets and writers, sketch artists, and I must confess, I do have a habit of including a sketch of myself in the sketches quite often, and various kinds of writers. Now poets, they're steam engines that stand in lines, enormous and amazing, that squeal and snort, like whales in sport, or <coughs> elephants a grazing. I did not contend the poetry was profound, merely that it was written. We were hosted on our excursion by uh, the great model conductor, Captain Rollins. 
and we knew the excursion was officially beginning when Captain Rawlings stood on the platform at the back end of the six cars of our train and hollered out, all aboard! And the hospitality on this journey was excellent. This was our, our barkeep, our host, uh, Jacques. Jacques had uh, very excellent talents, and in particular, he was always quick to respond when somebody would call, pour us another round, Jacques. And he came to be, perhaps, the most loved and respected employee of the B&O Railroad <laughs> during our excursion. We first entered West Virginia, what is now West Virginia, still Western Virginia at that time in 1858, at Harper's Ferry. We passed across the magnificent covered railroad bridge into Harper's Ferry. Now Harper's Ferry was already famous in a certain sense as a scenic spot, the confluence of the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers, the well-known Jefferson Rock. Thomas Jefferson himself said that he felt that the view from Jefferson Rock of the confluence of those two mountain streams was worth a trip across the Atlantic. Well, I don't believe he was exaggerating too much. In fact, uh, Mr. Jefferson was a pretty truthful man. We stopped there for about four hours. Uh, many of the 50 or so uh, people that were on our excursion uh, went up to Jefferson Rock or they climbed up to Maryland Heights or Loudoun Heights to look down upon the town. Uh, they visited the shops. They visited the Federal Armory there. Now myself, having been born nearby in the neighborhood and having spent many boyhood hours in Harper's Ferry, I took advantage of the opportunity for a nap. When we reached Martinsburg, there had been considerable rain. So the rail yards at the station, there was a great uh, roundhouse and shops there, uh, a great uh, source of employment for the neighborhood, but the tracks were pretty wet, a lot of puddles between the rails. Our conductor, Captain Rawlings, other people said, uh, oh, well, somebody get aboard so these ladies that are joining us here at Martinsburg can get up into the car, or should we get a chair? And Captain Rawlings knelt down one knee in the mud, and the other knee propped up, sturdy as a limestone arch, the young ladies were able to use him as a step to get onto the platform of the train without so much as a speck of mud on their fine slippers. As we proceeded on to the westward, we spent the night at Berkeley Springs, at the spa. And while we were there, we spent the night, and we had uh, many fine entertainments, uh, music, uh, some people playing cards, uh, different kinds of shows, things such as uh, The Learned Elephant, some silhouette shows. The Learned Elephant, a very amazing creature, appeared to almost have, when it was questioned, human intelligence. I, I do not know how they accomplished such a thing. And then as we went further westward, we crossed the Allegheny Mountains, the crest of the Allegheny Mountains. And there, a number of our group decided that they would ride on the front of the engine, perhaps patting its iron sides as though it were a pet. And all of the ladies on the excursion were assured that before they would climb on the front of the train for that ride, that all rules of modern railroad safety would be strictly adhered to. <laughs> a bit further on, we crossed in through and across the Cheat River Valley. Some of you may have seen the Great Tray Run Viaduct. This is what I wrote at the time, that the Cheat River region is this great scenic lion of the road, and the Tray Run Viaduct is mechanical wonder. The railroads along a steep hillside, roughly 300 feet above the bed of the river. There's a ravine coming down at right angles, and the main gorge of that ravine is where the viaduct carries the train. 
masonry work than with iron work on top of it. And it may look a bit familiar because the great seal now of our new young state of West Virginia carries on its reverse side an image of the Trey Run Viaduct. A good demonstration of the pride the people of our young state take in being the site of such an engineering marvel. As we got a bit further on, we stopped at Grafton, another a great terminus of the railroad, and in fact where the railroad branches out and the northwest extension uh, heads towards Parkersburg from there. While we were stopped upon the Taggart River, several members of our party took a steamboat excursion. Now this steamboat did not have the power that our engine, a trusty old number 232 on the B&O Railroad had, and in fact, uh, some speculated as to whether or not the steam engine powering this boat did not really have much more energy to it than that tea kettle that we looked at earlier. But it chugged its way along, the scenery was fine, and we were enjoying each other's company, and you may notice again that I have included myself in the sketch. Now when we passed through Harper's Ferry, our train had actually passed over top of another significant form of transportation, the canal, the CNO Canal. And the CNO Canal, still competing today in the 1870s with the B&O Railroad as to which one can more quickly carry freight and which one can do so most economically. The railroad does have a great advantage there. The canal ends at Cumberland. There were plans to continue that canal all the way to the Ohio River. But they determined that no matter how many plans they drew, the canal by its nature with the opening of locks and dams loses water. Well, eventually we reach our destination of Wheeling. Now Wheeling had long been a prominent place because of its position essentially at the head of navigation on the Ohio River. This was not easy navigation. It was much easier uh, in the spring, in the fall, when you had higher water in the river, but it was significant enough that steamboats were constructed in Wheeling. And this is an example of one that I sketched about a year before the artist excursion when I had visited Wheeling. The whole goal of the B&O Railroad was to connect the eastern seaboard with the commerce of the Ohio River, hooking the seaboard up with the heartland of America and stitching all of that together. And the eastern states were enthusiastic, Maryland was enthusiastic because Baltimore would have much uh, commerce passing through it. The canal was also aimed at the same thing, getting commerce there. In fact, the Commonwealth of Virginia was in an unusual situation where the entire western part of Virginia, most of which is now our state of West Virginia, was cut off from the commerce east of the mountains because of the mountains themselves. And in fact, the easiest way to get from many parts of western Virginia to the capital in Richmond was to pass through Maryland or perhaps even Pennsylvania to be able to catch the seams in the mountains. When you get over around uh, the Shenandoah Valley, there was a famous route still often referred to as the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road. Many of the settlers in the mountains of Virginia and North Carolina came in through Philadelphia, then followed roads out around Lancaster and down through the Shenandoah Valley. Instead of climbing and dropping off of the mountains, they followed the seams. They went with the topography. Now also there in Wheeling, we saw 
the famous suspension bridge. Part of another form of transportation. The great national road. The national road passed across that Wheeling suspension bridge. It had its uh, difficulties in its early years. Uh, there was a great uh, windstorm that came up the Ohio River Valley, and the cables held up, but the steady cables coming down were not able to stand the stresses of that storm, and the deck of the bridge fell into the river. According to eyewitnesses, it bucked almost to the top of the tower over there, twisted and then fell in one motion, splashing down into the river. <coughs> the bridge was rebuilt, and they were able to get traffic back on it on the National Road. The National Road carried things like Conestoga wagons with commerce heading out to the river. And eventually, the National Road was extended onto the northwest of the river to also bring in farm goods, grains, corn from the Ohio River Valley and from the areas where Indiana and Illinois are lying now. And this stitching together of the commerce of the nation was a, a very important part. And some people would say, well, why couldn't they decide whether they wanted roads or they wanted railroads, or they wanted canals. They weren't sure which would be most useful. They weren't sure which would succeed. Further to the south in Virginia, there was the James River and Kanawha Turnpike, and also the James River and Kanawha Canal. They ran into the same problem when they got to the mountains that the CNO Canal had run into. There wasn't enough water. Now, another very impressive thing about the railroad, we had spent four days traveling 379 miles from Baltimore to Wheeling. We'd spent several nights on the road. After we'd arrived in Wheeling, there was a great reception. We were greeted by the dignitaries of the town, a treated to a wonderful dinner, and then at about 11 o'clock in the evening, we got back on the train. And just 16 hours later, three o'clock the next afternoon, we disembarked back at Camden Station in Baltimore. The astonishing speed of nearly 24 miles per hour with us riding in comfort, sleeping, chatting with each other, just an astounding thing that the railroad has done for us. Now, Here's the Harper's Magazine, 1859. You know, it, it's amazing that it's as freshly printed as this is, <laughs> that it looks so old. How did you, how did you uh, make it happen that there's a major mountain named after you uh, up the road here by, it's between Spruce Knob and Canaan Valley, right? No. I, uh, I know of no such mountain. You know? um, it would be quite a singular honor to have a lofty peak named for oneself. However, since such honors are generally conferred posthumously, yeah. I'd prefer to delay receiving it for <laughs> Very surprised. Well, if we have exhausted that, I, I will turn it over to that young man that I referred to earlier.
The events that October evening lasted only about an hour, but it became very clear that that man's abilities had caused a lifelong obsession with his possessor. I'm having fun. Good. <laughs>